You are listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. I'm Elena Paventa, Executive Communication Coach and TEDx Organizer. With each episode, I'll share with you communication tips and ideas from top business leaders to help you excel in your career. Welcome to the next episode of Ideas and Leaders podcast. Today, my guest is Devina Stanley, and she is advising executives all over the world for over 25 years on communication. So she's helping, she's founder of a Clarity First program where she's helping clients all over the world to communicate their ideas clearly and quickly. And communication is the topic that I'm passionate about. So I would really like to speak about executive communication today. Hi, Devina. It's great to have you on Ideas and Leaders. Hi, Elena. Great to be here. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. So, Devina, what inspired you to start supporting executives in uh, clarity in their communication? I was really, really fortunate. I've had a really organic sort of a career and I grew up on a farm thinking anything was possible, but having absolutely no idea what that meant. And so I went to teachers college and learned to teach young children, moved into corporate communication by a series of accidents. And then in another happy accident, started working with McKinsey as a communication specialist in Hong Kong. And, you know, when applying for that role, my husband found the job ad and he he showed it to me and I was like, okay, great. That sounds interesting. But what's McKinsey? What's management consulting? I had no idea. And I just thought it sounded interesting. And so I, I got the job, which was wonderful. I loved it. And it was hugely challenging. And I think that sparked my curiosity because it turned out I could communicate. I'd learned some communication techniques at Teachers College from an Australian author called Mem Fox, and that had really helped me get my teaching job and it had really helped me start in corporate communication. And so it was something I could do, but I also liked teaching it. You know, I really enjoyed helping other people get better at it. And so at McKinsey, I learned a very structured way of thinking to, that it's a, a technique called the pyramid principle that sits underneath all of our communication if we're really, really clear. And so I just kept playing with it and finding it really interesting. And well, how do I get better at helping people to do this so that they can clarify and convey complex ideas so they can get better decisions more quickly so they don't need to spend their nights and weekends reworking papers and presentations. They can actually have a really constructive process that's actually enjoyable to get to the heart of the message, even when they don't like writing and they don't like using PowerPoint. So I just really enjoyed helping other people, you know, and, and getting better at doing the thing and helping other people do the thing. So I think it's just for a random reason, and I don't know what it is, it just sparked my curiosity and my love of helping other people. So does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, it's, yes, absolutely. There's not, a, there's not a light bulb moment or anything like that. It's just been following my curiosity and my want to help other people. Yeah, yeah. And also you put your knowledge and your experience now in a book. You're now a book author. Mm -hmm, uh, your book mm -hmm. is out called Elevate. And then mm -hmm. the next book, Engage, is coming up. It is also on communication, on leadership communication. Mm -hmm. So what uh, led you to writing those books? And maybe if you can tell us a couple of mm -hmm. words about those books, what can we read about there? Absolutely. So the more I was helping individuals, the more I realized I needed also to be helping their leaders, because there's an element of collaboration that happens when teams are preparing papers for decision. So if you're writing for a, a steering committee or a leadership team or a board, you're typically putting forward a point of view. And you can do that organically, but it becomes a real mess 
and people get stuck in track changes, iterating with all these little minute comments on the side of, you know, a Word document or inside PowerPoint, they might stick notes on side a slide and the comments become very minute. They focused on the minutia of the story. So it'll be things like, oh, I don't think we should talk about that here. I think we should talk about it there. Or, you know, so-and-so doesn't like that language, you know, tighten those words, say that sentence better, all, all those sorts of things, which are important, but they're late stage things. And what I found was that if we can help people collaborate early on, about what their message needs to be in a really structured way. We, we save a whole lot of that fine, detailed commenting. We create something that's much clearer. It's much more on point. So, you know, clear means, okay, I can see the message, I can find it. You know, but then once you find it, you want it to be useful. You want it to be high quality. And so to learn to write, you very often get closer to, to insight, but you, you do much more work with clarity rather than quality of insight. And that's where the collaboration comes in. So I wanted to help teams collaborate better so that they can work out what that message is, have that oh, that's it sort of moment, ideally during regular work hours, Ideally not late at night when they're sitting at their computer thinking, how do I fix this document by themselves? So do it together, do the thinking bit early. And, you know, it's not easy, which is why these communications become really messy. But if we have some techniques for working out, what do we want to achieve? What do we want to say? Once that's clear, we can do it on a single page and test it with our stakeholders really easily and then create the document. And the document's actually really easy to do once the messaging is right. And so I, given I do this with my clients and, you know, I'd started getting a little bolder and saying, look, I've got to speak to your manager before I work with you. I've got to work with your division head before I work with you and have a conversation and actually help them understand their role in this or actually even I'm going to work with your CEO if that's appropriate, if that's the level I'm coming in at. And I started doing that and finding that they were very, very receptive to this idea of lifting the quality of thinking in people's papers and presentations and giving everybody a method to iterate on the thinking without working on 15 pages of text or as one CEO said, what I liked about the technique that I was offering, I, you were offering, I was offering, was that I wasn't advocating 16 rounds of iterating on a prose, you know, word document. I was saying, actually, get the thinking right first, work that out and do it on a page so that he as the CEO could review that within a few minutes, 15 minutes, maybe sit down and make some notes on it and send it back and then create the document. So there's this shift in the operating rhythm and the right people start doing their jobs rather than the CEO or the C-suite person rewriting their team members' communication or rewriting the communication of people several levels below. You can actually get people at the right level doing the right job. So yeah. Sorry. I really like this, uh, the, the concept of thinking early <laughs> and planning communication, because I think this is so crucial. Uh, I see it very often when I work uh, with, with my clients, with, with speakers, with TED speakers, and then I ask, so what, what do you want to speak about? And they start showing me their PowerPoint slides. And I'm like, no, this is the end. What you are showing your PowerPoint. Let's now speak about your message. What is your key message? What do you want people to do? How do you want to inspire them? So I, I really like this concept of thinking early, thinking of your main message of what actually, who this communication is going to, what is the key takeaway? What is the call to action? So I think it is so important. And, and then now you're speaking about a 30-second rule that it is very important to convey ideas within 
30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I think that it is very ambitious. <laughs> I would love you to get <laughs> to give us some more information to our listeners yeah. how we can do this, especially in a corporate environment where very often we have a lot of information to share. So what should this clear and concise message convey actually? That's beautiful. And you're right, it is difficult to do it, but it's really possible. And the idea is that once you work out what that message is, and you can say it in 25 words or less, again, another challenge, but then support it at a high level. So let's just imagine, you know, let's just pick my book, Elevate. It's, you know, it's not that long, but it's it's not short either. So if I can get to the single idea and then unpack that into chunks and work out not just what the topic is, for each chunk, but what am I actually saying in each chunk? Then I can go down into the detail. And the idea is that if you can come up out of the detail and structure that really high level message that ties the whole thing together, then your audience can find that really quickly and go, oh, that's what they're saying. Terrific. I want to know more about that. And then particularly in decision-making communication, if you're seeking more budget or you're seeking approval for a project or something like that, you've got a number of people who are in your audience. You've got a multidisciplinary team typically giving you the go or no-go with that business case, let's say. And some of them are going to know more about, or want to know more about the economics of it. Some of them are going to want to know more about the practicality of it. Some of them are going to want to know more about, well, how does this align to strategy? Some of them are going to say, well, actually, I just need proof that it aligns to strategy. I just need to see that they've thought about that. Others might have a deeper interest and so want to go really deep on that particular issue. So if you can come up and provide that high level framework, if you like, for that paper, that set of messages, it means that your audience can navigate it so much more easily. So one board member fed back to me that they now spend only 10% of the time they used to spend to understand the papers so that they're freeing up all that time to actually be able to say, well, oh, that's interesting. What do I think about that? Rather than okay, now I've got to get out some coffee and some chocolate because my brain is really exploding. I need, you know, and to allow them to work through every line to get to the general message. So even just having that idea that you can sum up your paper in a single sentence um, is, is really important and then have a couple of levels below that as well. So the idea is to make it really obvious and easy to find that high level messaging so it's bigger font there's more white space around it in the document so that oh there it is easy I can find that oh interesting now I want to know more about each one mm. so even really complex things you can get to the heart of really quickly of course it means that the author has to get out the coffee and the chocolate mm. you know push through and to think and to sort their ideas you know yeah yeah I think we can think of this in terms of a newspaper article or a journal where we always have this headline on on top in bold mm. letters and what actually this article is about and then if we are interested then we start reading yes. so yes we just need to understand that not everyone reads everything and has time to go through everything and to listen to everything we we have limited amount of time so we need to have those short snippets for every piece of communication right correct no absolutely and I think having studied journalism there's an interesting difference in the way newsletters write as well that ability to craft that headline it's like a, a brilliant sort of skill um, but it is it's one that we can apply in our, our work as well the idea being that instead of having just that headline and then the writer working from, you know, the bigger idea and just unpacking it line by line so that usually you can't skim a newspaper article. You know, you, you actually have to read 
until you get bored and don't want to read anymore. Whereas what we're doing here, I suppose, is taking that principle and then applying it in a slightly different way to each section as well, not just to the main headline, so that you can skim the hierarchy of the thinking all the way down rather than having to read from beginning to end, which mm -hmm. is what you're sort of required to do, certainly in a news article. So I'd say yes to news articles and a bit more. Mm -hmm. A bit more. Yeah. That's a great uh, metaphor. So what are usually some of the most common communication mistakes that you see when you work with executives all over the world? Do, is there anything that keeps repeating and that we need to kind of be aware of in our communication? Mm. It's very tempting. And I saw this just yesterday working with the client to describe what we've done, to go through all the analysis or all the thinking that's been done to get to a conclusion before the conclusion appears at the end. So I think that's, that's a very helpful thing to document all of that. And part of what's happening there is that the author is writing down what they did step by step because what that's doing is helping them clarify what their message actually is. So they try and take their audience their decision maker on their own journey rather than saying what should the decision maker's journey be okay they need that conclusion we need an extra million dollars so that we can adjust the way we're solving this problem okay well what their natural question is going to be well why is that true why should I give you a million dollars and then you've got to come up with your reasoning as to why which isn't the same as saying Here's all the things that we did. You know, you're flipping it on its head. So I think that's the most common challenge people have is to flip the order and then pull out of all of that analysis the real reasons why they should get that million dollars as and by example, you know, for an example. Mm -hmm. So what would you say would be the the good order if we ha want to have this persuasive communication for example we want to get a budget let's say do we first have this call to action what we need to have and then give the reasons or do we first use storytelling and then all give the reasons and numbers and then have the call to action in the end look I, I think having it near the front is the thing to do and the way I suggest people do it is begin with a really short introduction and there's room for what I think some people call storytelling in that space, but it needs to be really fast. And the purpose of the introduction is to draw your audience towards your main message, to prepare them for it. And so you might, for example, say something like, uh, well, one option would be to say, I'm thinking of a, a retailer story. So you might say, We've had big problems with the supply chain in our supply chain in Nebraska as the beginning. And then you say, well, I've got some suggestions for fixing the problems with the supply chain in Nebraska. Here's what I think we should do. Or you could say, Ned from Nebraska last week was the 50th client who was really frustrated that he got the wrong order. He ordered a television and he got tea bags. Okay. And so you can make it colourful in a really, really short way. And then, you know, why are you telling me that? Well, because I've got a strategy to help the Neds of Nebraska and everybody else in that state get what they ordered on time. Great. What's your suggestion? And there's your main message. So you can go very, what I call it, very straight and factual, or you can use story, but I think it's got to be really quick and, you know, very, very short, because what really needs to be discussed is the recommendation. And then how you structure that recommendation, the sitting underneath that, I think there are a number of ways of doing that. We, we talk about two different ways of organizing your ideas. One of them is a group of ideas. And in this case, you would say it's a group of reasons, a list of reasons. Or an alternative would be to use what we call a deductive structure where you're building the case towards your action plan and, and so on. So I, I use two different ways of doing that. And in the books, I talk about 10 different patterns or structures that you can use for different kinds of business stories. And 
my hope is that once people work out what they want to achieve, so for you know, in the Ned from Nebraska story, you're thinking actually we want agreement around our business case. So if you know you need agreement around a business case or a strategy, then there's a smaller number of patterns that you might choose from. And do you want to say, hey, we've got an amazing opportunity here. This is the best way to capture it. So let's do this. Or do you need to shake them a bit? Do you need to say, look, we've got a really big problem that you don't know about. So let me explain. This is really a big deal. And however, good news, we've got a solution for it. So let's implement the solution. So that's a, two different versions of a deductive structure. So by understanding your context and what your audience knows, what they don't, what you need to achieve and deliver for the organization, you can choose one of these different patterns to adjust the tone, if you like, and also the type of message you deliver. So, you know, if you're if you've got an opportunity, it's so much more fun to tell the story. You know, that's a happy story. Hey, we could go and, you know, lift our sales or improve this because we found this terrific thing, this new technology, this new opportunity. It's so much more fun to tell that than, oh dear, we've got a really big problem, you know. So you really have to judge the situation a little bit as to which one is going to help. And there are others as well that are more neutral. I'm just pulling those two mm -hmm. out. So that's where the communication strategy, I think, comes into play. You know, thinking about, well, what do we really need to get these people to know and understand? And how do we want them to feel in this conversation? You know, can we legitimately, legitimately excite them with an opportunity? Or is that really pretending something negative is positive? How yeah. do we be authentic and yet very, very clear and insightful while we tell our story? So part of the premise I've worked from is that there, there are patterns and having been doing this for such a very long time, I think there are. I worked initially with seven, but I think for these senior, senior leaders, you know, there's 10, the, the stories are more complex. So that's why I've, I've landed on 10. Mm, wow. I didn't give you a direct formula, but I, I think I gave you a way of getting to mm. how you structure the message. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for those tips. I think that it is useful for our listeners to have those structures in mind next time when they will try to persuade someone and uh, we can find more structures in your books your books, Elevate and Engage. I will put the links to your books under the episode in the show notes so that our listeners can learn more if they want. And I liked the concept of not making storytelling too long and uh, having it short because I think that storytelling is too like romanticized right now that oh we need to tell stories and tell stories but in business we don't have much time we really need to use those storytelling techniques as you mentioned we can do it in just one short sentence but we don't have to actually tell something for a long time but it is good to capture always to capture attention but in a very short and concise way as well. And, um, and then uh, the last question that I wanted to ask you is about the age of uh, digital communication, digital communication platforms. Do you see any challenge in um, executive communication right now with the rise of digital communication platforms? We have so many of them. We have to be present everywhere. We have to be on, on 50 different platforms at the same yeah. time and be active there. Uh, so what would you recommend? How should executives, how should leaders adjust their communication strategies to this digital transformation? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting challenge, isn't it? And if I'm reflecting back on one of my clients was thrilled that they said, right, we're introducing Slack or now we use Teams, but the same, those sorts of chatting tools. And the idea was to cut the email traffic and it did that. But what happens is that those Slack channels or Teams channels just become, they go crazy. There's so much stuff on them. And so I don't think the core principles change in a sense in that 
this idea that you've got to work out what you need to say to whom doesn't go away. The medium, I think some of these tools for chatting can be really helpful for teams to have quick, you know, less formal to and fro and solve micro problems. I think that can be very helpful. But I worry that they create, like you said, an enormous amount of clutter. So knowing how to navigate what channels you should be part of at what level, I can only imagine is, is a really big challenge. So I don't know that I have any answers for that other than perhaps having very clear purposes for the different channels. Um, I know some people say to me, well, if somebody copies me on an email, it automatically goes to junk. I'm not interested. So creating filters for yourself, you know, I think is really important. Oh, I don't respond to emails from almost anybody. Um, if someone really wants me, they'll knock on my door. So I think people end up with all sorts of strategies to just filter. And um, I don't have recommendations for that because I think they are quite situation specific. Um, my only advice is to think really hard about who you want to communicate to and what you want from them before you start chatting. My, my fear is with these chatting channels that people just let loose very quickly and don't think enough. So it, it creates possibly more clutter. Yeah, and from every team message, I know some people, they get reminders. Every team message, team's message, uh, mm. because and there are much more messages because some people, they write short messages. There are so many tools right now. There's Airtable, there is Slack, there is uh, Teams and mm. all sorts of social media that we need to be on and follow mm. some trends and, and people and build personal brands. So I think that... Uh, you are right that we need to be strategic about it and we need to be mindful of who do we want to communicate to and what, what do we need to communicate and whom with do we need to speak. It is um, very important to introduce this um, mindfulness and uh, intention into this. <laughs> So, mm. uh, Devna, to sum up our our conversation, I wanted to ask you for um, your main tips to our listeners. So, what do you recommend? What should we start doing, stop doing in our communication, in our leadership communication? Beautiful. I think the first thing is to make sure if you're a leader or if you're a team member, work out what you really need from your communication. Be very, very clear about what specific outcome you need from what person on the decision-making body. So be specific, not general, not just that board or that leadership team, but think very, very specifically as to what outcome you need before you write anything. So do that and do that together. And then secondly, I think agreeing what the high-level messaging is, is really key. And by that, what I don't mean is here's the list of topics we're going to talk about. I mean, specifically, this is the main message we're going to convey. And here are the two to five supporting points that will back that up. And each one of those points is a full sentence that explains itself in entirety. Together, they are summed up by that main message. So I give them two be very, very careful to understand exactly what outcome you want. And secondly, work out your messaging before you write your document. You know, use constraints, get it on a page, make sure it's really, really clear. Once it's clear, then write your document. Take notes by all means, but that's not writing the document. Keep those things separate. Perfect. Perfect. Great recommendations. Thank you so much, Devina. If uh, our listeners want to reach out to you, want to contact you, where can they find you? Absolutely. So come to clarityfirstprogram.com and you'll find all the, all the information you need. Perfect. So I'll put this link in the show notes and I would also add and remind our listeners about your books, uh, book Elevate and then Engage. Uh, I will put the links to your books also in the show notes because I'm sure that we have a lot of useful information there on, on leadership communication. Thank you so much, Devina, for being on Ideas and Leaders podcast. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Likewise, Elena. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thank you for listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. Did you enjoy this episode? Let me know that you listened by tagging me in your LinkedIn profile and using a hashtag Ideas and Leaders. See you in the next episode.